All right, for our last story, I want to talk about a New York Times, a New York Magazine cover story on someone named Andrew Huberman. Now, Andrew Huberman, and it's really interesting how fame works these days. In one sense, Andrew Huberman has become a very popular and famous person. He has millions of people who listen to his podcast. And uh, I was talking to our team about this earlier today about how fame works now. Fame has become so fragmented. There are so many people who, in one sense, have become quite famous. They have millions of fans, millions of people who listen to them. And yet, if you don't listen to them, if you're not a fan of Andrew Huberman's podcast, it's very likely that you've never heard of Andrew Huberman. And so fame is this very fragmented thing where there's a lot of people who have very popular YouTube shows and say comedy or culture or streaming or podcasts, and they have bigger audiences than almost every one of these mainstream media corporation shows. You have 500,000 people watching CNN. You have millions of people listening to the podcast of Andrew Huberman. So he's very famous in one sense, and yet a lot of people haven't heard of him in another. That's true for so many people now who influence, uh, who, who wield influence in our media culture. And I think that's because of the decentralization of what the internet has done. There's not just a tiny handful of corporations any longer controlling the flow of information. People can find whoever they want to listen to by the millions. And these people become much more influential than those who work inside these media corporations. Obviously, Joe Rogan is a perfect example of somebody who hasn't worked for a media corporation in many years. He worked for NBC News 25 years ago as the host of a reality TV show for a couple of years. But by and large, Joe Rogan built up his entire massive audience outside of the structure and framework and therefore the rules of corporate media. And that's the reason corporate media hates him so much. Andrew Huberman is somebody who has done the same. He's a neuroscientist. A few years ago, I think in 2019, 2020, he started a podcast. And like so many people the, the, during the pandemic, when people couldn't go out, they were online all the time. He found a massive audience. Talks a lot about neuroscience, but about self-help. I have to confess, I've never listened to his program before. I'm not very well aware of him. I don't have a strong opinion about him one way or the other. I've seen his name around. I knew he had a popular podcast. But I'm not here to defend Andrew Huberman because I don't really know much about him. What I saw, though, was a bunch of media people today promoting a story, a cover story, that is on New York Magazine. His face appears on New York Magazine. And here you see it on the screen, Andrew Huberman's Mechanisms of Control, the private and public seductions of the world's biggest pop neuroscientist. And it's written by a New York Magazine journalist named Kerry uh, Hawley. And... I saw a bunch of media people talking about this like it was some big Me Too scandal, like there was a bunch of shameful, dirty secrets and Andrew Huberman's dating life that had been exposed by this article. I saw people congratulating her. And I assumed that there were a bunch of stories similar to a report of the kind that they did on uh, Dave Portnoy of, uh, of uh, uh, Barstool Sports, um, who they obviously hate as well, where they tried to me to him in a way that, came, that I think turned out to be very uh, factually dubious at best. But I assumed it was that kind of an article by the way people were talking about it. Oh, he's been exposed. He's uh, a very abusive person. And I began reading through this article expecting to find that because there's a lot of people in the media talking about it. I assumed there was something really dark and sinister here. And the more I began reading it, I kept reading it. It went on and on and on and on and on. It was this endless article. And it was basically nothing other than reporting on his adult dating life. He's a 48-year-old man. He is very focused on fitness. He's very big. He's very muscular, conventionally handsome. A lot of women find him handsome. That's part of his appeal. It's the reason why a lot of people listen to him. And he's unmarried. He's a bachelor. He's wealthy. He's a neuroscientist. He has a lot of charisma. That's why people watch him. And so, as you can imagine, he dates a lot of women. And this article didn't do any, it tried to destroy his reputation. You can see here it's framed his mechanisms of control. So you assume it's some kind of like article about his abuse with women, his misogynistic uh, 
network of, of women that he's manipulated and abused non-consensually, that's what you're expecting, and you're reading it, and you're reading it, and it's just basically nothing other than a report interviewing women that he is dating and still has dating, and I guess the worst thing that they found out about him was that he was dating women who didn't realize he had other girlfriends at the same time. He wasn't married to any of them, and that's it. I mean, there's nothing in this article that's even journalistically justified to publish, let alone something that's scandalous. I was actually going to go through it, uh, and I'm actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't even want to give it that level of attention. I guess one of the things that it alleges to try and justify itself is that there was a woman he was dating who had unprotected sex with him, and she says it was because she assumed they were monogamous, when in fact he was dating somebody else, which I guess means that the minute you become a public figure at this point, not even if you hold public office, he's not a senator, he's not a cabinet official, he's not somebody who wields public power, he's a podcast host. I guess, he's, but he's not even married, so it's not even adultery. I mean, I guess the worst thing you can say about him is that he dated a woman and was dating a different woman without one of the women knowing. And if this is the stuff of cover stories now, then I guess it means that it's fair game to go around following every single journalist and tracking their private lives and seeing who they're working with. I guess I should read some of this since I'm commenting on it, um, just to give you a sense for how filthy and baseless this entire article is to try and ruin the reputation of somebody whose crime is that they have developed a much bigger audience than anybody at New York Magazine possibly could and has done so on their own. Quote, Sarah's relationship with Andrew began in February 2018 in the Bay Area where they both live. Sarah was willing to have unprotected sex because she believed they were monogamous. Through a spokesman, Huberman says he did not become exclusive with Sarah until late 2021, that he was not doted on, that tasks between him and Sarah were shared based on mutual agreement and proficiency, and that their Thanksgiving plans were tentative, and that he maintains a very busy schedule and shows up to the vast majority of his commitments. And that was because she had complained that sometimes he didn't show up for things, that he wanted he put more burden on her in the relationship than I guess he was willing to take, like the most banal, conventional, trivial, standard complaints in a relationship that they decided to air. The relationship struck Sarah's friends as odd. At one point, Sarah said, quote, I just want to be with my kids and cook for my man. I was like, who says that, says a close friend. I mean, I've known her for 30 years. She's a powerful, decisive, strong woman. We grew up in this very feminist community. That's not a thing either of us would ever say. In August 2021, Sarah says she read Andrew's journal and discovered a reference to cheating. She was, she said, quote, gutted. In 2021, she tested positive for a high-risk form of HPV, one of the variants linked to cervic cervical cancer. Quote, I have never tested positive, she said, and had been tested regularly for 10 years. A spokesman for Huberman says he has never tested positive for HPV. According to the CDC, there is currently no approved test for HPV in men. When she brought it up, she says, he told her you could contract HPV from many things. Sarah said she grabbed Andrew's phone when he had left it in the bathroom, checked his text, and found conversations with someone we will call Eve. Some of them took place during the camping trip they had just taken. Caught having an affair, Andrew was apologetic. That's, I mean, we pretty much picked the worst parts of this entire multi-thousand page article. As our friend Sagar and Jetty said, who's the... I'm sorry, I have many thousands of words, not pages. Um, I mean, I think it's at least 5,000 words, if I had to guess. It's a very long article, and it goes on and on like that about nothing but his dating life. As Sagar and Jetty, the host of Breaking Board, said, quote, just a few months ago, New York Magazine published a practical guide to polyamory, and yet today they're somehow so concerned about the sexual mores of the unmarried, most popular health podcaster in the world. Um, there you see the cover story celebrating polyamory. I mean, I guess they would say that polyamory is a consensual relationship between more than two people, whereas the crime here is that Andrew Huberman was dating women without talent. I mean, the fact that they would delve into this person's personal life, there's no allegation of sexual assault or abuse, let alone 
sexual crimes like rape or anything non-consensual at all, it is these liberal outlets, and New York Magazine considers itself a serious political magazine, are so trashy. They're so vindictive. Really what happened was they saw somebody who is very successful. He's been on Joe Rogan's show before. He encourages men to engage in self-care. I guess they decided he was an ideological enemy. They set out to destroy him. They dug into his personal life. They really found nothing. They published it anyway. These people are sick and evil. Imagine setting out to try and destroy somebody's life by digging into their dating activities when they're unmarried, when there's no allegation of anything abusive, simply out of resentment that they built a popular and independent platform that they can't control. I will say, as I said before, that you know, when these people get laid off, and this is the sector of the media that gets laid off so much, they expect you to cry for them. They demand that you feel sympathy for them. And it's very difficult to feel that. Because this is not just trivial, though it is. It is deeply toxic and destructive. These people, this is, this is just a moral scumbag behavior of the worst kind. And this is what they do over and over. And when there's a part of an industry that is toxic, if there's, say, you know, if I think that the uh, indust industrial agricultural industry is guilty of all kinds of moral atrocities, they are threats to the public health. When they fail, I celebrate because they're toxic to our society. I think they engage in a lot of harm. That's the same for how I feel about this sector of the media. And so when they fail, it's something to celebrate. It really is true that no matter how much you hate this wing of the corporate media, it's really not enough. And they have wrought the failure onto themselves. And so if you're one of those people who celebrate when they lose their job, when they're massive layoff, when these magazines close, don't feel guilty about that. It is completely well-deserved. And the kind of... Uh, commonality between all three of these stories that we covered tonight, that NBC News is so enraged that a Republican Party operative might contaminate their sacred integrity, that Kara Swisher is celebrated by the very people that she claims she holds so accountable on the fact that New York Magazine set out to destroy a person for no reason other than the fact that he can't be ideologically or substantively controlled because he found an audience outside of their failing corporate structures. It really is all the same thing. It just shows what Bitter and resentful people are inside these outlets. The fact that their failure is so well-deserved and the fact that although they brand themselves as holding power to account, what they're really there for is to serve the powerful and to destroy anybody who's a dissident, anybody who in any way pushes against the grain of the prevailing orthodoxies inside these institutions of power. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.